thank you very much. So I'm going to talk about the human voice. And actually, it's quite interesting to me because I grew up not actually in Manchester. Um, I grew up, the road, grew up up the road in Blackburn. Um, and somebody said to me recently, oh, oh, you must have really lost your accent when you became an academic. And I thought, no, no. Oh, God, yes, I did. I absolutely did. That's what I did. So what I'm going to talk about today is actually our voices and the kind of information that we express in our voices. So, for example, actually, the first time I did stand-up comedy, I thought, oh, that was brilliant. And I went off to listen to it afterwards. And A, actually, there was a lot less laughter than I'd remembered. Uh, <laughs> And B, I sounded like a terrified woman from Blackburn because I had com I'd reverted back to a really kind of true voice and that's really where I'm going with this today. So to think about our voices, actually, what we need to think about is, is human evolution because we only sound the way we do at all because at some point in our evolution we started to walk upright. And what this did was it freed up many aspects of our body, a lot of what we can do results from this. One of the big things that we do is we freed up our rib cages and we can use them very differently. So we are all using your rib cage right now to stay alive. You're using your rib cage to breathe, don't stop, okay? The track at the top there is showing you very sinusoidal smooth movements of your rib cage going in and out. It's from a breath belt just around the outside of the chest. And that's you all getting air in and out of your lungs, don't stop, you're all doing that. We also, Use, and this is very specific to humans, when we start talking, we take a breath in and then we use the same muscles in the ribcage to produce a very finely controlled flow of air. And if I keep talking without taking another breath, and you can see here from a breath bottle what that would look like, you can hear, but my muscles start to have to work really, really hard to squeeze the air out, and in the end I'll run out of the Now, you're probably thinking, Sophie, that's weird, but... We can only talk at all because we can do this. That's where our voices come from. That's where we're putting in melody and rhythm and sort of duration to speech. And although it doesn't feel like it, we have as much fine control over those muscles of the rib cage as we do over our hands and our fingers. That's how precise these movements are. And what we're doing is we're controlling the flow of air through our larynx. And what we're doing is we're making a sound at the larynx. If I ask you all to put your hands on your throat and you go now goes. Can you feel a vibration? That's the vibration. And if you look at that, this is just alarming. Okay, we've just got to put <laughs> acknowledge that everyone's allowed to go ah. And now, okay, but we've all got one. Um, and that's the larynx. That's what actually look that looks like. In our evolution, actually, it's a structure that stops things falling down into the lungs. And what a lot of different animals do is they bring the larynx together and then breathe out through it to make a sound. And that's what we're doing when we speak. Um, it does make a quite a strange buzzy sound. So if we record just from the larynx, you can hear what I mean about the rhythm and the melody. So if you can see if you can recognise what's playing here. Anybody recognise that? Jack and Jill, exactly. So it's a very familiar nursery rhyme. And you can recognise it because it's very, very stereotypical rhythm and pattern. And that's all coming in here. The rib cage and the larynx are doing that. And in fact, individual differences come in here as well. So I'm talking to you right now with what's called modal voice. I'm holding my vocal folds in a particular way so they make a particular kind of vibration. If I hold them in a different way, that's called creaky voice. And that's a sort of slacker sound. And it's a big part of an American accent or a rather posh accent of English. So it's... Um, it's, it also gets called vocal fry. People can really lose their minds about it, but it's just a, just a different way of making a sound down there. Now, what we do with this sound is we then shape it with our articulators, our tongue, our jaw, our lips, and we look at a dynamic MRI of someone talking. You start to glimpse the complexity of this. So as you can see the talker here, she's moving her tongue, and it's going into all these different positions. Our tongues are unique in nature in being uh, muscular hydrostats. It's more like an octopus tentacle than anything else. And other mammal tongues don't do this. They can't dart around and reshape and reform in the mouth like this. And she's using her soft palate, the stuff at the back of the nose. Um, the lips, the jaw, the shape and the sound. And then that gives us speech. But it also gives us a voice. So what we tend to do in my area, in neuroscience, is we look at people talking and we say, yes, there's language, we know about language. But as soon as we start talking, we're expressing all this other stuff about ourselves as well. As soon as you start talking, people can have a good guess at your sex, and that's because men, adult men, have got a different location for their larynx. In puberty, the larynx drops a second time, and what you get is a longer vocal tract, just a bigger space to make sounds in, and larger, thicker vocal cords. So just like a bigger musical instrument can produce sounds with a wider spectral range and a lower pitch, that's what you find in a male voice. You can physically see it. That's a man on the left and a woman on the right. He also tells you your age. 
as you are growing up, your, the pitch of your voice changes as you get physically larger. And then, in fact, over our whole lifespan, our voices change. So what you find is that in older adulthood, women's voices can start to drop associated with the menopause. They become more masculine. And men's voices often start to rise in pitch because the vocal folds start to get atrophy with age. People can spot your health from your voice. All sorts of different disorders can be picked up from the voice, including common day things like a cold. People can pick up your mood. We've probably all had those conversations with somebody saying, no, I'm fine on the phone. You think, I don't think they are fine. I don't think they're fine at all. You can pick up their geographical origins. So I'm from Blackburn. People in Blackburn think people from Accrington have a hilarious accent because they say buzz. And <laughs> now, I, you know, I realise that it scales out everywhere. Well, you're always giving some kind of, even, you know, there's still quite a lot of Blackburn accent in what I consider to be my posh academic voice. Um, your socioeconomic status. So if you're from the US and you say walking rather than walking, people will consider you to be less employable. And in the UK, the same is true if you do what's called TH fronting, if you say month instead of month. So that's actually just a direct socioeconomic assessment people are making of you based simply on how you're using your voice. And also our voices will show all sorts of stuff about our affiliations. So you'll talk more like people that you want to be like. You'll talk like people that you're fond of. And in fact, this bleeds into another aspect of voices. It's all a performance. We think about actors going out on the stages doing something specific with their voices, but actually all of us are performing us all the time in our voices. So if you look at children, anatomically, boys and girls are not different. The pitches of their voices should be the same, but boys speak with lower pitches than girls because they're picking up the voices of the adult men around them and they're talking like them. They're being male in their identity. Women in the West speak with a lower pitch than they would have done 40 years ago. This seems to track women moving into the workplace. So um, famously, Margaret Thatcher was coached into lowering the pitch of her voice. But actually, if you go back to films from sort of 50, 60 years ago, everybody's pitching their voices right up here if they're a lady. And it just sounds quite noticeably different. Now, if you go to different parts of the world, you'll find this is more exaggerated. If you go to Japan, it goes in the opposite direction. Women speak with higher pitches, much higher pitches than they do in the West. And they will rise the, raise the level of their pitch if they're if there are men around. And men in Japan speak with lower pitches than men in the West. They are exaggerating the difference with their voices, and we seem to be trying to minimise them. We will change our voice depending on who we're talking to. And I've been on the phone to my mum. I talk like her for about half an hour afterwards. You know, love my mum, don't really want to talk like her. And it's really unavoidable. I just move my voice over to hers as soon as we start talking. And all of us do this all the time. Men will raise the pitch of their voice the more they like the woman they're talking to. Just leave that one out there for coffee. <laughs> Hello. Um, and voices reflect who we want to be. They reflect how we'd like people to see us. And that can be highly unconscious. So all these things will be kind of driving what you sound like that might actually be really who you'd like people to think you are. So when I come back up north, I start to become more northern immediately because I'm trying to think, throw off signals saying, I'm not like all those other southerners. I'm very nice, really. <laughs> One of the things that's weird about voices is we never hear our own voices, we hear those of other people. As soon as you start talking, your ears actually stop working in the same way. They, don't draw, they do not send the signal in the same way. You're hearing your own voice through your body, which has got a lower, it's better at conducting lower pitches, which is why your voice always sounds surprisingly high pitch when you hear it on recording. And also, our brains, actually, as soon as we start talking, what we do is with lots of parts of the brain in auditory areas, really are activated when we're speaking because you're using stuff like the noise around you to kind of guide your voice and fit your voice in. But you also specifically start turning off certain auditory parts of your brain when you're speaking, the same parts you would use to listen to someone else. So in fact, when you are speaking, you do, your brain does not hear your voice as you're hearing other people's. And this is why I didn't notice when I was first doing stand-up that I sounded like a terrified woman from Blackburn. The other thing about voices is they can do so much more than we realise. This is an impressionist I've worked with a lot, Duncan Wisby. And this is Duncan going from his lowest pitch voice up to his highest pitch voice, which he does a lot for CBBC programmes. Well, really dropped his lowest down. You start to see it move up. Hello, Hello, buddy. Part there is that 
the front of his tongue never stopped talking. So he's talking all the way through, and the whole back of his tongue distorted round while he was that octopus tentacle again, while he was changing actually what his voice sounded like. And although, as I say, we don't necessarily realise it, we're all capable of these changes. And in fact, we change our voices all the time. And of course, we can do more with it. We can take our voices off into extraordinary places. So we had the opportunity last year to make one of these images, which is called a dynamic. MRI scan, so we're running the MRI scan like a video camera, of the opera singer Leslie Garrett. So I'm afraid she gets so loud at points here it starts clipping, it sounds a bit strange, but here she is singing in the scanner. I dreamed a dream in time gone by <laughs> When hope was high and my blood style of style singing that evolved such that people could be heard without amplification and next to an orchestra and you can actually see that happening the, the volume she starts to be able to produce is being completely mapped by the size of the shape she's making a vocal tract she's opening up this great big instrument and just sort of hurling sound out now just to finish I used to start all my talks by saying human speech is the most complex sound in nature no other animal can do what we do with our voices and I thought, this is it, and we can see how we change the voice and where we can go with the voice. There, that's amazing, and we talk with this, it's incredible. And then I met a beatboxer, and I realised we're pretty much doing the bare minimum when we're talking. We are doing the very least we need to, to get a signal out there. So this is uh, Reap's one, Harry Yef. Now, in beatboxing, well, beatboxing is producing polyphonic music with your mouth and whatever style you want it to be. Now, in traditional phonetics, what we're told is that we use this vocal track that I showed you to make sounds. We make one sound at a time, and then we kind of shape that. And Harry reaps one. He can make at least three sounds simultaneously. And, and, and theoretically, you're not supposed to be able to do that. Nobody's told the beatboxers. So I'm just going to finish with a very quick glimpse of what that looks like in dynamic MRI and how much more complex it is than speech. the evolution of speech is that everything that we use for talking and producing our voice had to be in place before we were talking. All of these adaptations, this flexible tongue, even these short mouths that we've got, these domed roof of the mouth, the lowered larynx, the breath control, all of that had to be there before we were talking to each other. And we don't really know what pushed that. But I'm wondering, when we look at beatboxing, if it doesn't suggest to us a whole other role for the human voice, which is as a musical instrument. That might be entirely why we have it that way. Maybe beatboxing is telling us a lot more about why we can talk at all, why our voices sound the way we do. So our voices are really fascinating. It is comfortably the most complex musical instrument in nature. Lots of other animals can make incredible sounds, but in fact we make the variety, the richness, the plasticity, the variation of what we can do with this very ordinary equipment that is what we're normally using just to chat with people is unparalleled in nature. And it's at the same time an unbelievably complex social cue that we're using to tell people about who we are, how we are, and who we'd like to be. Thank you very much. <laughs>